you pronounce your name exactly? Aspercage. Can. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure. Yes, no, it's not clear at all. Just a few words before um, we get on to the press conference while the photographers are at it. Uh, vous connaissez la routine. Si vous avez une question à poser, soyez assez gentil de lever la main de façon à ce qu'on puisse vous voir, de façon à ce que le micro arrive jusqu'à vous. Quand vous aurez le micro, soyez assez gentil de vous lever, de vous présenter, de poser votre question, de vous asseoir et de rendre le micro. You know the drill. Uh, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand a little bit ahead of time so we can see you. Uh, more importantly, so we can get the mic to you. When you have the mic, please stand up, introduce yourself, uh, ask your question, and then sit down and give the mic back. Thank you very much. Bonjour à tous et bienvenue pour la conférence. Welcome to the press conference on Patterson. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the press conference for Patterson. Sitting next to me and sitting at the very end, uh, two representatives of the body, dare I say, or the brigade of producers, uh, Carter Logan and Josh Astrakhan. <laughs> sitting next to Mr. Logan, uh, she hails from Iran. But with uh, Eden, with Pouleo Prune, Marianne Satrapiz, with the deux amis, les malheurs de Sophie, she's proved that she could uh, make movies in France. And with Exodus and this film, she proved that she can work anywhere in the world, only with the best. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ms. Golshifte Farahani. <laughs> We saw him on screen here a few years ago in the Cohen Brothers Inside You, Willin Davis, but he's had a very busy year. Uh, he, within, I guess, 12 months from film goes point of view, he uh, was Darth Vader's grandson in the new Star Wars. He was in Midnight Special, and Jeff Nichols was with us this morning. Oh, yeah. And he is Patterson in... Mr. Jarmusch's film, Mr. Adam Driver. <laughs> and since Stranger Than Paradise got the camera door here in Cannes, practically all his films, I may be missing one, but I'm not sure, all his films came to Cannes, Mr. Jim Jarmusch. <laughs> I'll throw the first question at you, uh, Mr. Jarmusch. Um, sorry to you guys. How do you write dialogue for a dog, giving him all the comments and punchlines? Um, the dog was such a good improviser that <laughs> really she, it's actually a she playing mm -hmm. transgender, playing Marvin, <laughs> and uh, was remarkably good at writing her his own dialogue. So. Thank you very much. Very easy. Question here. Peter Hall from the Toronto Star. Congratulations on a wonderful film. I loved it. Um, I wanted to ask Jim, you know, I noticed that I, the, the French version of your, of your program notes, I don't have the English ones, you have an explanation of what the film is about, and I don't recall you doing that before. I was wondering why you felt you needed to tell us, because don't you think by, we know by now what a Jim Jarmusch film is? Yes, um, I didn't write that. Uh, I, I did write a small director's statement, so the, uh, the rest of it I'm not responsible for. <laughs> but I think he was referring to the director's statement. 
Oh, I've always written a short uh, statement for each film. Um, so I, I like to give a, a, just a small impression of intention, but not a synopsis or trying to explain, really explain the film. But thank you for your comment and questions. You Hi, it's Sperling Reich with Showbiz Sandbox and Celluloid Junkie in the US. Um, we're here at a film festival. Everybody loves films here. I would imagine your great lover of films is uh, based on your movies. Yet in your film, you actually have a moment where the characters are going to see a movie. And one of the characters says, this feels uh, like we're living in the 20th century. Lately, there's been a lot of talk uh, and, and media reports about how uh, movie going is declining. And is, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, do you think that it's kind of an antiquated way of seeing art? Wow, I, I don't know. I'm not really a cultural analyst. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't think it's antiquated. Uh, I, I, th I still think it's a very... I love going into a dark room with strangers and seeing, entering a world and uh, experience, experiencing it together on a big screen. So maybe I'm a dinosaur in that way. I don't know. I think there are still many people who love that and love it as a form. And it's very important to me to preserve it uh, in terms of at least cinema text or ways you can see old films the way they were intended, films from way, made way back in the 20th century, for example. Um, so I don't know. Uh, things change. Ways of disseminating things change. Tools we use to make them change. But I don't think the experience of seeing a film on the big screen really can ever change. And we're so excited to see our film in the, in the Grand Palais, which is incredible. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm kind of old school in that way. Although I'll watch a film any way I can if the only way is to see it um, VOD or, or in a di digital device. Uh, I, I, I just want to absorb the, 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 the gift of the film. Hello, my name is Jordi Oliva from TV3, Television of Catalonia. I would like to ask you about the music, the music by Skule. Who's a skill or who are a skill? It's not. It is not the kind of music one would expect in a Jim Jarmusch film. Have you changed your musical taste or widened your uh, musical text? In what way do you think it's unexpected? May I ask? <laughs> in what way is it unexpected for you? Because I don't know. I think you have more. You have um, more an old school taste for. For, for music, and uh, this music is more ambient music, we could say. Yeah. Well, I don't know how to answer that. I, I've used so many different types of music in my films, from Ethiopian music from the 70s to soul music from the US to Gustav Mahler and classical music, uh, Franz Schubert. Uh, I've used music by uh, hip-hop music, uh, music by Killer Priest, uh, the Wu-Tang Clan. So I've used many types of music. I, I love music. Um, this is the first time um, using a kind of electronic ambient score, which I was very... From the, Even while writing the film, I, I was thinking of an electronic ambient score in my head. I don't know by whom. And in the end, uh, the score was made by our group Squirrel, uh, which is in this case, my, and always myself and Carter Logan. Um, we scored also with Josef van Vissem, uh, our previous film, Only Lovers Left Alive, but with much different uh, dirty electric guitars, distortion, and lute music. And in this case, we, we tried some uh, uh, music by other electronic composers. And we were really studying the whole history of electronic music just as fans. But in the end, we decided to make it ourselves. And we, we, it was Carter and myself who m made the music uh, using synthesizers um, and avoiding, intentionally avoiding sequencers within synthesizers. So the instruments don't play themselves, uh, which is, can be very beautiful, sequenced electronic music. But all of this was electronic instruments played by 
human, analog humans. <laughs> so uh, we made the score ourselves in the end. Uh, good yeah. afternoon, uh, Yishun Kong from Sina.com. So, uh, well, I personally am very, I'm very glad to see, I'm surprised to see that Jared Gilman, sorry, Jared Gilman and Kara Hayward present in the film because they are the leads of the very first film I saw at Cannes Film Festival, The Moraes Kingdom. So uh, I'm really interested in that how you uh, kind of encounter with them and chose them to uh, you know, play the roles in your film. And um, basically, how did you uh, choose the actors for the minor roles? For, for, the, for the people, passengers on the bus for each other days. Thank well, you. Thanks for your question. Uh, well, uh, those two, I, I w I'm a Wes Anderson fan. I, I love his films, especially his last few films get more and more childish and beautiful for me. So uh, Moonrise Kingdom, I, I loved these two characters very much, so I had this idea to offer them this small character, so just a small appearance in our film, and I was very happy when they said they, they would like to do this. So. Um, they talk about anarchists, which is a kind of part of history of Patterson, New Jersey. Uh, so I was very happy to have them uh, in, in the film. Uh, the other characters, the s smaller roles, were all cast with the help of um, Ellen Lewis, who I always have worked with, and Megan Rafferty, who she works with and worked very closely with me. So they helped me find the other actors for the characters besides Patterson, Laura, and the Japanese man at the end of the film. Um, but all the other ca characters besides Kara and Jared were uh, cast by, w I, was I was helped find, I got help finding them with the casting directors. Go ahead. Hola, uh, I am Ernesto Garrat from Chile. Uh, I'd like to have a question for you, Mr. Jarmuch, and for you, Mr. Driver, Mr. Jarmuch. Uh, can we can we talk with us a little bit about poetry? Uh, the movie is beautiful, and uh, how do you develop um, your script, just the structure, in order to achieve the poetry itself? In the and Mr. Driver, how was for you build this character? Uh, for me, it's a big performance, and how difficult was or what easy was for you? Thank you. Oh, um, I think that the script itself was already so strong and the writing and the characters were so clear that I think the biggest thing I tried to do was not get in the way of it or anything on top of it to, to try to force it into something that it didn't want to be. They have like this uh, schedule that has, for the, the movie, that has like a, a line that describes that they, uh, things that we're working on in almost every one of the descriptions always says, you know, Patterson listens to girl reading a poem or Patterson listens to the waterfall. And, and going through, there was just so many s sentences that started with Patterson listens. And so for me, I'm like, how great is it to, um, that was a lot of information to play a character for a couple months where his main action is to listen to everybody else and listen to, you know, the environment that he's walking through and, um, I, that that was kind of um, I know you, you should listen uh, uh, anyway in movies, but that were it was so much a part of his character to be a, a fly on the wall that was um, I got a lot of information out of that. But everything else is is all in the script and the the people that Jim assembled are all so good. It, it kind of get, getting out of their way and um, at, yeah, the end. <laughs> well, as far as, and no offense, uh, as the actors, the two leads are concerned, uh, you, ma'am, have the enthusiasm of someone who's repainting the, the curtains, wants to learn the guitar, wants to cook, wants to have cookies and go to the market, da da da, which is, in a way, stuff that you need to do. He, on the other hand, so you, sir, as you pointed out, you just have to listen. And when you don't listen, you drive a bus. And when you don't drive a bus, you listen again. Mm -hmm. It takes a hell of something, beside talent, to just listen 
throughout and build a character that way. Yeah, but it's also like I trust Jim as the first audience member that uh, that that's enough. That I, I think that that's kind of enough. Listening, I think, is enough. And that's, I mean, you're not really given that opportunity often in a movie. It's all, you know, very, it's acting. It's very much about action. But to kind of be a, an audience member in a movie in a way is really, really... Um, an exciting thing to get to do, and then you know, because Jim is in charge of it, my scene partners are Gul Shifta and Barry Shabaka and William Jackson Harper, all these great actors. I mean, it, it, it's not, it's, it wasn't boring, you know, it wasn't, um, it was really how, how could you not be excited by getting to play a character who's just observant, you know? I don't know if that, I don't know if that answered your question, yes, but, yes, uh, you do, no. thank you. But mm -hmm. to add to that, I have to say that there's something close. Obviously, they're playing characters, they created something, but within their own personalities and approaches to their work, there are similarities I could find with the characters they were creating. And Adam is not uh, an analytical actor, he is a reactive actor. He's very, very, I don't know, intuitive in a way, which I love, which is the way I like to work. And so there's that observational, reactive, quality that also Patterson has. And Golshifta plays Laura, and Laura is, as is Golshifta, radiant, warm, um, lovely, uh, talented, intelligent, vibrant, and, uh, and beautiful, and all those things, of course, she is. So it wasn't very difficult, you know? So I, it really, they, they did the work, and I have to say, on all this film, the collaborators I had the chance to work with are remarkable. Um, uh, Afonso Gonçalves is here, the editor, uh, one of the great editors, and to work with him is a pleasure. Fred Elms, our director of photography. Uh, Mark Friedberg, the production designer, who works often with, with Wes Anderson, and we've worked together before. Um, our sound designer, uh, Bob Hine, I, these are just remarkable people. So I, I just felt so lucky to be there each day and just kind of stand around and, okay, let's do another take. And uh, I don't know, it was a very magical thing to have these kind of collaborators. Catherine George, also our, our wardrobe, uh, our costume designer, and then these producers who protected us always to do what we wanted to do, what we needed to do. So it was really a kind of wonderful gift to, to work with all these people for me. Any comment, Ms. Farahani? Oh. <laughs> me, I, I really don't know what to say. First of all, I always ask Jim, why on earth you casted me? You had like thousands of great actors that are there and I still didn't understand when um, I remember when I was 12 I watched Coffee and Cigarette um, in Iran uh, by um, like a TV program passing by the Islamic Republic um, channel and I discovered that in Iran and as I was a teenager, a very young teenager, I learned Jim Jarmusch's name and I was saying, oh, my favorite director is Jim Jarmusch, Jim Jarmusch. And then when he contacted me, it was like a dream come true. I couldn't believe and um, even while working, I was still asking myself, is it really happening or is, is it uh, just a dream? But then I realized that it's all about um, when we talk about happiness, it's about people that are able to live the present moment and not being taken by their mind into future and past. And that's why sometimes we're so miserable. And this couple, I think they're not miserable because they're living whatever is happening and, and that very moment, Patterson more internally putting in putting it into poetry and Laura externally and putting it into art and creating and painting curtains and doing stuff, making cupcakes. And they have such great amount of empathy and love for each other. It's not a passionate love. Maybe it's, it's an eternal, long lasting love that can last for so long. And I learned that from Jim that it is possible. Question over there. Uh, good morning. 
congratulations on the, on the film. For me, it's a masterpiece, uh, like uh, most of your films. Um, Mr. Jarmusch, I have uh, two questions, or precisely one, one question and a joke. The, the question is about, uh, I, I come from Italy, your, um, uh, you, um, your homage to Italy um, with the photo of Dante and uh, Petrarch, Petrarch um, sonnet, and uh, the, the dialogue in the bus concerning Gaetano Bresci. Uh, why did you choose uh, these poets and these uh, particular anarch Itali Italian anarchist, anarchist? And the uh, second question, it's just a joke. It's just, a, it's just a, I, I noticed there is the Patterson is the, the main character in Patterson, but he's a bus driver, this Adam driver. So you chase oh, by chance or purpose. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's the, the main reason I cast him. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. Well, you know, uh, Italian poetry and this tradition and Dante and Petrarch, these are some of the great gifts of poetry in any language. So they just found their own way into our film. It wasn't really me putting them there somehow. Um, but what was the rest of the question? I've completely forgotten. Oh, Gaetano Breschi. Ah, yes. Uh, Gaetano Bresci, or they say Bresci, they mispronounce his name, but they also say Italian, so this was intentional. Uh, yes, uh, Patterson, the, the city of Patterson is very uh, important as a model industrial city, which was envisioned by Alexander Hamilton, and uh, it was the textile center of, of North America, um, silk workers and textile workers. And a lot of these workers came from Italy, from Ireland. Uh, in fact, in the early uh, 18th century, uh, 19th century, many of these workers were Irish children who worked for 13 hours a day, six days a week. Um, as a result, there was a large uh, reaction of workers and anarchists. There were very, very major historical strikes in Patterson, New Jersey. Uh, for workers' rights, most of them ignored and these strikes broken. Um, but in any case, uh, he was a famous anarchist who came from Italy to Patterson. Uh, he went back to Italy and what he did there uh, is part of the, f you'll have to see the film. Oh, I guess you already have seen it. Yes. Anyway, yes, this is an important element of another historical kind of footnote of Patterson. Question? Hi, Jason Gorber from Cineplex.com and Twitch Film. Um, in, the, in the film with the poetry, you talk about sometimes there's internal rhymes, which you like a little bit better than explicit rhymes. This film seems to rhyme a little bit with the likes of Ghost Dog or even Dead Man in terms of its thematic. I'm wondering if you, uh, or even now with Iggy Pop, another Patterson individual in your documentary that you're also showing here at Cannes, I'm wondering, uh, Jim, if you could talk about how this film sort of reflects upon some of your other works in terms of use of language, in terms of use of poetry. And Adam, you have a character who's a Marine who has learned to be quiet through his use of his poetic expression, holding in the rage. I wonder if you can talk about the difference between playing a role like this, where it's all about the internal, versus something slightly more external, like perhaps a Star Wars character. Okay. What was the first part again? Uh, it was all internal rhymes. Oh. That yeah, I'm sorry. I'm very bad at analyzing my own films or comparing them. I don't know how to do that. Uh, each one is its own thing for me. Um, obviously, they have stylistic and, uh, I don't know, in their content, there are things that repeat and interweave. I don't really analyze that. I don't look at them once they're finally finished again. So I, I can't really answer that. I can say of the two films we are presenting here, um, they are very different stylistically. But they are both about the idea that you in your life can choose your, your path. You can choose what you do in your life. And Patterson is about that. In these characters that might seem on the surface cliches, uh, a housewife. Um, she's not a cliched housewife. She's someone very illuminated and interested and uh, very active in 
within just the confines of her house, she's very creative and uh, expressive and chooses who she is. And the same with Patterson. He's a man who drives a bus every day. Um, but he chooses to be also a poet and, and to be both these things. And it's, in, it's his choices in his destiny. When we are lucky enough to have these choices to make, um, it's both of these films. Also, Give Me Danger, the story of the Stooges, is about choosing your own path. And both these films, on some level, celebrate that. But beyond that, I'm very bad at analyzing my own our own films. Um, I'd say similar to what Jim is saying about, I didn't think of it as like, a, oh, this is someone who uh, I'm going to compare to Star Wars who kind of externalizes everything and he internalizes it more. I, I, I think that just because the writing is was so good and so clear to me um, that I, anytime I would add anything on top of it or try to make it something else that seemed like the movie doesn't really want it. Like you can feel it right away where um, that's just me trying to play an idea. I, I didn't think of it as, uh, um, I mean, it's definitely a challenge that, that um, in that uh, Jim puts things in his movies that asks a question and doesn't answer it, which I, you know, obviously think is great and true to life and all those things. But um, having moments where you get a glimpse of maybe who he was before without being obvious or feeling the need to dumb down something for an audience and explain why, you know, he, um, this past, see, you know, as you may know, my past life, I did this, you know, it kind of stays away from that. I, I latched on more to the, um, the, his structure, how he's very structured in life or very structured in his going to work and uh, so he's kind of allowed himself to drift and and uh, he has a job, he's driving a bus, but he can still listen to everything that's going on. He's just made it very structured in one end, so in his work or in his art, he can be very um, open and free, and uh, where I would say that Laura, I don't, I don't know, it wouldn't be the opposite, but he's, um, that's what I latched on to first and didn't think of um, the end result, I guess, of this is an internal character. And it's not important to me, really, Adam's, um personal past, particularly in terms of a, a role, because he's just, to me, a wonderful actor. But I must say, I'm very, I was very struck by the idea that, that he understands um, sort of both sides of, well, he's an artist, and he was, he has experience in the military, and he went to Juilliard. And these two things are very, kind of impressive to me, because again, it's breaking any kind of cliche of either thing. And, and Adam personally knows both sides of, of different things, and that was very interesting to me and uh, informed in the script. Uh, originally, Patterson, there was no re reference to anything in the military, but we, we did make some reference, a small one, into the film just by a photograph. So. I really, I'm very impressed, and I love that, that he, uh, I don't know, he's very balanced and understands different sides of the world and of people. And he doesn't uh, broadcast any of that. It's just something he knows and he brings, and he's reactive and uh, not over-analyzing everything. And what a pleasure to work with him. He had to be there every day in every scene. I felt bad for him. Oh, God, you got to work with me again. But uh, just the pleasure of Adam and Golshifta, I, I can't say it was every day. Seeing them, I just lit up to get to, to play with them. So it was great. Question over there. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Amir Hashemi from Picture World magazine, Iran. Uh, Mr. Jarmusch, you have made a magnificent, dreamlike movie in praise of uh, poetry. Uh, considering you. the fact that you have cast one of the most acclaimed Iranian actresses as your main character, as one of your main characters, I wanted to ask you uh, whether uh, are you uh, familiar with Iranian poets? Have you studied any Iranian poems? Um, not so much. Uh, I know, and I can't remember her name. She made the film The House is Black. 
Yes, Full thank you. But I'm a bit ignorant, and it's something I need to study more of, certainly. I am very aware of the poetry in the cinema of Iran, and I've said this for 15 years, probably, that this is one of the gardens of cinema on our planet. So I'm very appreciative of that form of poetry within cinema. But um, the poets of Iran, I'm a bit ignorant and uh, need to learn more. But thank you. Question over there. Rodrigo Fonseca, TV Globo, Brazil. Mr. Jarmusch, your, your film is incredible. Uh, I would like to ask you to talk about your professional relationship with uh, Afonso Gonçalves, your editor. And another request. Uh, in the film, Laura and Patterson went to go to, uh, to the movies to watch a horror films, and they pay a beautiful homage to the, to, the, to the genre. Could you tell a few words about your interest on horror films? Well, first of all, uh, Afonso Gonçalves is a remarkable collaborator, one of the most beautiful editors that I know of. So we've now worked together on Only Lovers Left Alive and Patterson, and uh, he co-edited Gimme Danger, the story of the Stooges film. So, uh, wow, it's just a gift to work together. I, I don't know, we have something very, at least from my side, very strong and wonderful to, to get the chance to work with him. I say he has magical eyes and liquid hands, you know, he makes things so be beautifully musical, um, his editing. He also was the music editor of Patterson. Um, the second part now. Horror films. Well, I love cinema, so I love all kinds of cinema, and I love very old films. I'm very interested in uh, uh, silent films and films, uh, and I'm interested in films from everywhere, so I, I'm always trying to learn about films from Asia and Africa and uh, anywhere. Um, also, I'm not a, a genre snob. I, I like films of all kinds. So, um, f horror films, uh, crime films, science fiction films, all, all of these are interesting to me. Uh, the film that we, we quote in, in our film, um, The Island of Lost Souls, is a, very, is a film from 1932 uh, with Charles Lawton. And, uh, it's a story that's been made uh, several times in the history of cinema, so it was just something, I thought, an interesting choice, and uh, there's also a slight resemblance, in a way, of the wild panther woman in the film to our wild uh, Golshifta. So, <laughs> there was that also, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know um, how else to answer that. Question over there. Hi, I'm uh, Elena Smolina from GQ Russia. Thank you, first of all, for the wonderful, wonderful film. It's a masterpiece. Uh, and I was just wondering uh, about the poetry of uh, Ron Padgett. Uh, at what point did it become the part of the film? How did you discover it? Just basically share your thoughts about it. Yes, thank you. And our friend from Chile, we never answered your second part. But uh, um, Ron Padgett is a poet that I have loved very much since the 1970s when I first discovered him. He co-edited in 1970 the anthology of New York Poets, which became a kind of, for me, almost religious book because the New York School of Poets are among my favorites in the history of American poetry. This includes the great uh, poets uh, Frank O'Hara, John Ashbery, James Schuyler, um, of course, Ron Padgett and David Shapiro, Frank Lima, um, many poets now considered the New York school. So Ron Padgett, uh, some, we've been friends for some years, uh, and I just love his poems. So while I was writing the script, the poems I wanted to represent Patterson's work were poems by Ron Padgett. Um, we did use some of his pre-existing poems, a few that we felt uh, related to, seemed like Patterson could have written them, and then he also wrote new poems just for our film. So 
I'm very honored to uh, have Ron Padgett in our film. To me, he's a rock star, you know? He, he's an amazing poet and uh, an amazing man. We were hoping he might be here, but uh, he's, he's not. He also, I must say, has worked for uh, almost 25 years on the translations of the poems of Apollinaire, and he just finished them and published them this year. So uh, very beautiful translations of Apollinaire by, by Ron Padgett. Question over here. Um, Karen Batt for the Huffington Post. It's another question about the poetics. How much were you influenced by Wallace Stephen uh, Wallace Stephen Wallace's uh, poetry and his poetics of ontology of things just be, like the William water. William Carlos. Oh, Williams. I'm sorry, William Carlos Williams. Thank you, mm. William Carlos. Carlos Williams poetry, where you have just the snowman which exists and the waterfall which exists, and in your film I see things really just exist. And also, uh, could you comment on your poetics of repetition, always returning to the same, like the mailbox. The, the two people in bed and these repetitive poetic moments that create a refrain. So it's the influence of William Carlos Williams and your own poetics. Yes, okay. well, thank you. Well, William Carl Carlos Williams uh, was, uh, lived in Patterson his whole life. He was a doctor and a pediatrician. Um, he was a doctor, actually, oddly enough, for the artist Robert Smithson. I don't know if you know. Uh, the great earthworks artist uh, who died tragically young. Um, he was, I believe, Allen Ginsberg's doctor when he was a child. He had a full-time practice as a doctor, but he wrote all of this magnif magnificent poetry. And his philosophy is uh, a poetry of small details and things in daily life. Um, one uh, poetic phrase that actually uh, Method Man, who from the Wu-Tang Clan, who appears in our film, uh, quotes uh, is no ideas but in things, meaning that you derive ideas from the real world, from s the details of the real world. And um, Williams, Carlos Williams was a beautiful practitioner of this philosophy. So he's very important. Also the idea of having two jobs and being a doctor. Um, you, you mentioned accidentally, but interestingly, um, Wallace Stevens, another great American poet, a uh, kind of metaphysical poet, who was also a full-time executive in an insurance company in Hartford, Connecticut. And when he died, uh, one of his closest associates, another executive, uh, was shocked and remarked, wait a minute, Wally wrote poetry? <laughs> because he was a businessman, an executive. And uh, this idea of doing different things, of course, inspired Patterson. This is, of course, not unusual. Uh, Charles Bukowski worked in a post office. Uh, Franz Kafka was a bureaucrat. You know, the people have other jobs. But, but William, William Carlos Williams is very important because he is from Patterson, uh, and his philosophy and approach to poetry was very much a kind of, well, it informed things for us in the film. And when Method Man quoted William Carlos Williams in the little rap that he wrote for the film, I did not suggest that to him. He came to me with that on his own and had been reading some William Carlos Williams. So uh, the circuit c continues. Question over there. Yeah, my name is Parviz Jahed. I am the editor-in-chief of Sinai Film Journal in London. My first question is to Golshifte. As an Iranian actress, you worked in two different film culture. In Iran, you worked with different Iranian film <coughs> filmmakers, and now you experience uh, film uh, acting in French films, American films, and now with Jarmusch. Um, my question is, how, how did, do you think that you, ch uh, you achieved your, your goals and your uh, do you think that uh, uh, you, you, you achieved, a, you received a big achievement in your film career in the, at this time? Or, and how did you find working with Jim Jarmusch? <laughs> Was it challengeable Terrible. at all or not? Terrible. <laughs> and my, my question to Jarmusch is wait, 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 also... Wait, wait, one or, step at a time. Okay. okay. Go ahead. 
um, I forgot. No, 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 no. Yes. Um, I when uh, well I I started working in music and I was a musician and I, I was born in a artistic actor and writer family but I never wanted to become an actress and then of course it started as I didn't really want to but it came to me and then when I left Iran I didn't leave Iran for achieving anything I left Iran because I had to leave Iran because they didn't want me there anymore. Again, I didn't think I'm going to work again because I was in France, I wouldn't speak a word of French, and I wasn't going to achieve anything. But then again, things started coming back to me as, as like a fire inside me that was burning that uh, I couldn't stop it. And I never really wanted to achieve anything in my life. I just, I'm, I have dedicated myself to this work, I don't even sometimes know why, I just believe in it so much and I think uh, giving this gift to any spectator and adding something to the world of people, it's such a great thing uh, and if I can be part of it, it's such a uh, great gift for me and of course when this happened, I, I said it was like a miracle for me because it was like a sign from the universe that, wow, like uh, when the world is winking, it's like, yes, we are, it's, it's fine, it's gonna, it's good because I would never even dream of working with Jim because he's, I think, uh, I'm even happy that I'm living at the same time as him because I think he's a legend uh, for me and... Uh, it was amazing because Jim, beside being a great director, he's probably one person that I've seen that is, he's the most sensible, sensitive person. If an insect is moving at the far end of this room, he would mark it and he would have empathy for it, for anything that is, any creature, anything that is moving, or even the trees and, and the earth and everything, he's full of, empathy and love and to be able to share these moments with someone like him for me is just uh, heaven and joy. Yeah. Oh, thank Can you. I ask my question? <laughs> yes. Mr. Jarmusch, yeah, it's a very short question, sorry. Uh, Mr. Jarmusch, uh, you're a uh, major figure of American independent cinema. Um, and I wonder how uh, do you think about the situation of indep new independent cinema and how much did it change since the great uh, John Cassavetes? <laughs> wow. Well, do you have about an hour and a half for the answer? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I don't know really how to answer that. Um, things keep changing, certainly the way films are distributed and disseminated uh, technologically has really changed dramatically. So that's affected um, the way uh, how one is able to finance their films and put them together. So it's becoming more and more complicated for filmmakers. At the same time, um, I, you know, I always look for the new blood in the margins more than in the mainstream. So that's a bit, I'm not so mainstream oriented. Uh, and there are a lot of interesting younger new filmmakers making a lot of interesting things. So for me, I focus on the positive gifts coming rather than the, the difficulties uh, for, for all of us, you know. But I have to say, and financing our film was quite difficult and complicated. But in the end, with uh, K5 and with um, Amazon and, of course, Le Pacte, who I've worked together for years with Jean Labadie, he's like my French brother, uh, supporting my work, we were able to, to make this film in the way we wanted to. So as difficult as it was, we were also very lucky and honored. But yeah, it's, it's rough out there. But uh, there are film, you know, filmmakers got to fight for what they want to do. And um, it takes a lot of strength to not be disillusioned by the difficulties. But there are a lot of amazing films of all sizes out there as far as budgets. So just look for the interesting things. They're, they're, they're out there. And I gather by the two producers here at this desk 
attitude is your attitude is basically I'm there I'm I'm here if you need me otherwise I'll just shut up <laughs> I, I I did think when Adam was saying uh, that, though I I th I think he was underplaying a couple of things there, but I think when he said he's just trying to get out of the way, that's sort of our job too. Yeah, like try to build a help build a solid enough frame, and then don't fuck it up. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being thank here. Thank you today. very much. Thank <laughs> you.